Um, please, please take it away. Okay, hi everyone, welcome. Um, my name is Michael Cole. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Tartu in Estonia. I'd like to talk today about a, a book chapter that I've recently been working on, which um, analyzes Ramzan Kadyrov's use of football as a political tool during the 2018 FIFA World Cup and tries to put this in the context of how political leaders use football in general. So, uh, as I mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate in political science. I'm going to start back with a bit of the politics theory about what populism is. Then I'm going to mention which leaders I decided to include in my uh, study. How do they use football in different ways? Who exactly is Kadyrov? How does he use football in general? Um, and then what happened at the World Cup in Russia? And finally answer the question, did, do I think he actually used populist tactics? So populism is a word that we hear a lot all over the place, but actually in, in uh, academic circles, the term is extremely highly contested. So for the purposes of this study, I really understand populism as a way of doing politics or a political style. And it involves leaders or uh, politicians framing the world as divided into two opposing camps. So on the one side, you have the people who are good and pure, and against them you have the elite or the enemies. So as I said, the people are pure, they belong to a national heartland, and they have a shared identity based on this national heartland. But the elite or the enemies are corrupt, they're exploitative, and everything they do is to try to undermine the will of the people. So if a leader is to be successful using this political style, um, they need to in some way connect themselves to the, the idea of the nation and this shared identity, and also to demonstrate that they are somehow close to, or one of, the people. So obviously there are lots of political leaders and a lot of them use football, so I didn't include all of them. But in my study, I looked at um, those that were leaders of political parties, but not necessarily in power. So it wasn't necessarily presidents or prime ministers. Um, they're all ideologically right wing, although on this scale, some are further to the right than others. And they all appear to use football in different ways, strategically for their own political gain. So, I managed to kind of, obviously they use football in lots of different ways, but I managed to generalize by putting them into three broad categories of how they use the game. So the first one is celebrity endorsement. And a couple of examples here in, in Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, during his presidential campaign, got a lot of endorsement from well-known Brazilian footballers. Here he is with Ronaldinho. And in Turkey, Erdogan famously posed with Mesut Özil and Ilkay Gundogan a couple of years ago and then turned up at Ozil's wedding. So he used these players to court the German, uh, the Turks within Germany in order to get their votes in an election. There's also demonstrating the common touch. So during the World Cup, you probably remember um, the Croatian president, Kolinda Grabakitarovic, was often seen wearing the national shirt. She attended lots of games and it was highly publicized that she paid for her own tickets. She often sat with the ordinary supporters and she tried to tie herself to the Croatian people. And she was fortunate because Croatia did really well in the World Cup, but in Finland, until recently at least, they've not had a great national team. So this guy here is Timo Soini. He was the leader of the um, True Finns party, which was a, a populist right-wing party. And he actually adopted Millwall as his favorite team. Now, it's no coincidence because Millwall wear blue and white, and they're the same colors as the Finnish flag. And he often used to wear this scarf at political meetings. He also underlined his connections to Millwall um, because he's a political outsider and the song that Millwall are famous for, No One Likes Us, We Don't Care, seems to fit really well with his political stance. And the third one, which I think is even more interesting perhaps, is the use of football to demonstrate what leaders can consist of the nation and how to construct the idea of what the nation is. And there are two opposing, uh, opposite ways that this seems to have happened. So in Hungary, Viktor Orban um, has used football to, to demonstrate a, a view of Hungary in terms of a, a wider, greater Hungary. So he's expanded the idea of what people understand as Hungary. Um, and he's done this by sponsoring um, training camps for footballers in Slovakia, Romania, Croatia, Serbia, and Ukraine, amongst those Hungarian diaspora communities to bring them into the idea of what Hungary is. Um, in contrast, um, Jean-Marie Le Pen, used uh, football to demonstrate an exclusionary form of what the nation is. So he was famous during 1998 in the World Cup in France for saying that 
when French fans look at the team, they don't recognize themselves. And he's very critical of the players in the French side of African and Middle Eastern origin and how the, the problems that they had integrating and working together as a team reflect problems in the society as well. Okay, so who is Ramzan Kadyrov? Well, Ramzan Kadyrov is the leader of Chechnya, which is a semi-autonomous republic in the south of Russia, as you can see in the picture there. Um, and he first came to prominence in Russia back in 2004. His father, Ahmad Kadyrov, had been placed in charge of Chechnya. Um, he was Putin's man in the region to basically bring stability there. And he was killed uh, in a terrorist attack at a football stadium in Chechnya. Ramzan Kadyrov was flown to Moscow. Here he is meeting with Putin. And since then, they formed a very close personal bond. Um, in the West, he's known as this kind of dualistic character. On the one hand, he's a, a very um, famous authoritarian leader. He's accused of numerous human rights um, abuses, but he also is very well known for his social media account in which he presents all these kind of quirky pictures. And he recently was involved in a, a bit of a disagreement with John Oliver um, about something to do with Kadyrov's cat. Um, and how does he use football? Well, in several ways, actually. Um, one of the interesting things here is the team Terek Grozny. So Grozny being the capital of Chechnya. Now, Terek is well established. Kadyrov was involved in the, the running of Terek Grozny. And uh, a couple of years ago, he actually decided to change the name from Terek Grozny to Ahmad Grozny. So he, he gave the club the name of his own father and said that this would make the players play even better. He also named the stadium after his father, the Yakmat uh, Arena in Grozny. He has his own football camps there, the Ramzan Academy. Sorry, and he Michael. hosts. Sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry to jump in. Um, we're all still seeing your title slide. Um, oh. I, I, did, I did send you a message, but I'm not sure you're picking it okay. up. And so, yeah, sorry. thank you. Sorry. Oh, no, okay. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll share all this uh, later anyway, so it doesn't matter. Uh, but yeah, okay, cool. Thank you, Christina. Okay, I'll start this one again, right? So, Ahmed Kadyrov, he uses um, he uses football in several ways. So, he, he named uh, the side Ahmed Grozny after um, his father. He also named the arena in Grozny the Ahmed Arena. And he has a training camp named after himself, the Ramzan Football Academy there, as well as uh, hosting several matches for uh, famous footballers. Here he is with Maradona. Um, and he's also invited people like Franco Baresi and Luis Figo, which kind of lend some authenticity and legitimacy to his regime. So what happened at the World Cup? Well, of course, the World Cup in 2018 was held in Russia. And Chechnya and Kadyrov hosted the Egyptian national team, even though there were no games played in Grozny or Chechnya, the, the team still stayed there. And he also gave a very rare interview to the BBC Russian service in which he explained his motivation for hosting the Egyptian side and also used the opportunity to promote some of the ideas about uh, the region. So can we say that he used populist tactics during this uh, World Cup? Well, celebrity endorsement. Of course, very famously, he posed for a number of pictures with uh, Mohamed Salah, who you know, is, is a famous footballer and, he, and he's no ordinary famous footballer. He's one of the most famous in the world. Um, not only in the Middle East, but pretty much everywhere. Um, I even have Mohamed Salah on my cup here today just to show how famous he is uh, everywhere. So this was a real way that Kadyrov tried to legitimize his regime. Um, but that's, that seems quite obvious, but I think there was more at work than this. He also used the, the occasion to demonstrate the common touch. So. He said that Mohammed Salah is a Muslim brother and he wanted to pray with him, which is something that ordinary Muslim men might do. He also, quite humbly for him, mentioned that he loves playing football to the BBC, but he's not really very good at it. So this contrasts sharply with people like Putin or Erdogan, who tend to use sport to demonstrate how amazing they are and how macho they are. But probably the, the most interesting is this idea of how he used uh, the World Cup to construct an idea of what Chechnya is, to, to construct the nation as both part of Russia, but an important bridge between Russia and the Middle East. So he, he used this populist frame that I referred to early on when he said that in Chechnya, we're ready to accept guests and destroy our enemies. That's the kind of republic we are. Now, it might be normal for a leader to say, we're ready to accept our guests to the, to the country, but to say that we'll destroy our enemies would, would be quite surprising coming from some others. Um, he also mentioned that the Chechen people were happy that the World Cup is here, even though there were actually no games being played there. 
And again, this cements the idea that Chechnya is a part of Russia. And he said he wanted Russia to win the World Cup, which does the same thing. But within that, he also took the opportunity to mention how important Chechnya is. The Akhmat Arena is the best and most visited stadium in Russia. So this is not just an ordinary part of Russia. It's got something going for it. He gave Mohammed Salah honorary Chechen citizenship, which is quite strange because Chechen is not a country. There's not really such a thing as Chechen citizenship. And he used the opportunity to bridge between Russia and the Middle East. Salah's popularity in that region helps to legitimize Kadyrov there and also show that Chechnya is not only a part of Russia with important connections to Putin, but it's also an important link to the Middle East. So um, thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to take your questions now. And if you want to ask more questions, you can find me on Twitter. You can find my blog here where I've written a blog post which goes into these themes in a bit more detail. And also I've written some other things about football and identity in Poland. And I, I will, as I mentioned to Christina, I'll share these slides because I realized they weren't all visible, but thank you very much.